you can go call me Al. Um, I'm going to go through chapter two of names and values. Um, so the first little um, image that I've got with the bananas and the manga saging, um, it's just the way I kind of was able to get my head around the idea between an object and a name was like very obvious that we have these objects in the world, which are different from the names that we call them in different languages. So bananas is English, manga saging happens to be uh, Filipino. Okay, so why should you care at all about the difference between an object and its name in the first place? Um, because it might seem kind of irrelevant when you're trying to write code why you should care how R stores these things. And I think throughout the chapter, he makes a pretty good case that the reason you should care about it is that once you understand the difference between a name and an object in R, it'll, first of all, prevent you from accidentally copying things when you don't want to, because one thing that can really slow you down is copying objects unnecessarily. And secondly, if you have an understanding of how R is storing its various object types, um, then you can use them in a more memory efficient manner for their data type. And I think this is especially true when we think about loops and data frames. Um, we'll go through that case study. So throughout this, they use the lobster pad page to explore and kind of visualize um, what's under the hood for various objects. And so just to kind of get started, um, I've just some code to install packages. So this thing with if require pacman install pacman, I'm sure everyone has used it, but if you haven't used it before, I find it very helpful for when you're sharing your R code to a collaborator and they almost certainly don't have the package that you need installed. And then they try and run it on their machine and they're like, oh no, your R code is broken and I don't understand why. Um, so I, I have a tendency to put those two lines at the top of every single script I write. Um, but I, I work with a lot of non-coding people, so that's my personal way of installing packages. So what happens when we're actually making a vector here? So this is kind of like the hello world of understanding of an object. So I'm sure we've all done something like this. X, um, assign it to a, a, a numeric vector, one, two, three here. So under the hood, when we're creating a vector, what we're actually doing is kind of two things. Um, first, we are creating an object, which is a numeric vector here. And that's represented in these figures that he uses, which are like the rectangles with one, two, three. And then we're creating, we're binding a reference here, which is that kind of um, circle square X. And we're binding it to that object. So we can, of course, try to name this vector something weird if we really wanted to. Um, so for example, we could try to name a vector three because we want to do that. And if you want to do that, you can use back for non-syntactic variable names. Um, Inevitably, someone you work with is going to give you an Excel with terrible called names, and fix CSV will try to fix it. So it does this with a series of rules, um, and you can see how read CSV tried to fix this um, percent of people with two shoes and number of people with two shoes. Um, unfortunately, that might remove some meaningful information here. So for example, I would want to keep percent and number as things that I can keep and keep track of. Um, for that, you can use check names false and then fix it with the janitor package clean names. That's another thing that like, I saw that workflow on Twitter. It blew my mind. It saved months of my life. Highly recommend. Um, so. so we can do non-syntactic names. We probably shouldn't for our friends and loved ones, um, but we can do them. So what about what's happening here? So we're creating the vector, um, one, two, three. We're giving it the binding name x. And now we're saying y equals x. So what's actually happening under the hood here is that r is not copying the vector. What it's doing is it's assigning another reference to that same object. So here we have vector one, two, three. We point a reference x to it. And then we point reference y to it as well. So in these two example sentences, we still got one delicious bunch of bananas whereas both bananas and sagging in, this, in these two sample um, sentences are pointing to the exact same thing. Different references, same thing. Um, so we can confirm these objects are the same by checking their, ab their addresses with the lobster function object address. So this function will actually point us to the memory address that R is 
using for any particular object. Um, these strings will be different every time you restart R, so it's not like this random hexacode string is consistently being called on X or any vector one, two, three, but they will change every time you restart R. Um, so you can kind of confirm that these are the exact same thing. What happens to X when we change Y? Any, any thoughts? Anyone know? Everyone knows? Yeah? Give a yeah. Copy. Copy and modify. So X does not get changed. Um, and I think for some, for some languages that's different, but this is how R manages it. Um, so this is the behavior called copy on modify. So it wasn't until we actually tried to modify anything about Y that we needed to make a copy of it. So my example here when it comes to languages is that you can have two sentences such as that movie was bananas, where now the internal representation of what bananas means has changed, but it doesn't affect the meaning of sagging in the sentence, masarap ang mga sagging, which is that bananas are delicious. So that's kind of how I was thinking about it. You're, you have the same thing until the object needs to be different, and then you get copies. So when does an object get copied? So apparently this is not exactly intuitive in R. We can make all these kind of mental rules about when it happens, but the best way to do this, and what he recommends in the chapter, is that we use this space trace mum function. And what that does is it basically will output um, an object's address every time we copy it. So for example here, we create the vector, we turn uh, trace mem on to the x object using trace mem, um, and then it'll tell us this, and then we have y assigned to x um, output, because we haven't copied the object yet. Uh, we assign the third element of y to the integer four, and now we have an output of trace mem. Um, and then the next time we assign y to be, the third element of y to be the vector five, um, we won't have an output of tracement if we are running in our console. This is gonna be different in our studio. And the reason it's gonna be different in our studio is that our studio actually needs to keep multiple references to every object we make. And it needs to do that because we've got this environment pane where it's actually displaying us information about it. So if you do the exact same code, basically if you open up the terminal and run it and you do it in our studio, you will get different outputs, just as an FYI. Um, so what about what happens with function calls? So we can make a little toy function here, which just takes function A and then, you know, the input of A returns A back. Um, do we expect there to be any outputting here or copying occurring in this function? No so, copy. no, no copy, yep. Um, and this was the kind of picture that Hadley included. I think it's simultaneously kind of clear and a little bit obtuse. But the idea is that A is now pointing back to X. And since we don't have a copy of it, we're not going to have any copying here. It'll be exactly the same as if we did Y equals X as when we do Z F of X. So lists store references rather than values themselves. And this is important to understand when we think about how much memory space lists are gonna take, um, because it's often less memory than you might expect. So this is, for example, a list, which is one, two, three, and the list actually contains three references, two integers, which are one, two, and three. If we modify a list, this is especially important to keep in mind. So again, the same thing, we have list one, we sign list two to be the same uh, list. And then once we modify it, we have uh, now the original list is not copied, the so list one is not copied, and the bindings of one and two are copied. However, now we've got four pointing to another thing. So, we can use this lobster function, which is ref, which will allow us to visualize what components are shared between multiple objects. 
So when you do lobster rec on these two lists, for example, it has bolded the objects that are unique. And then when you run it in RStudio, I guess this is what it looked like. I didn't run it in our console. Um, and those objects which are shared, so for example here, which is two and three, those are not bolded to represent to you that these are shared across the two lists. This was kind of funky to me at first. Everyone with me so far? Yeah? Up? Down? Good? Okay. <laughs> okay. So this also becomes important when we start dealing with data frames, which is, I think, a lot of, I don't know, I deal, I guess, a lot with data frames. I think most people, a lot of their work is thinking in data frames. So data frames, what they really are is they're actually lists of vectors. Um, so we create this data frame, data frame one, and we have it be vector, a list of X and Y, which are references pointing to these vectors, one, five, six, two, four, three. This is intuitive in the way we think about why people tell you that you should modify columns and you should work column-wise on data frames rather than row-wise. So when you modify a column in a data frame, all you're doing is moving the reference. You're just moving the reference. You don't have to copy the whole thing. You copy the reference, and now one of those references is pointing somewhere else. So for example, in D2, what we do is we say D2 equals D1. D2, the second column, is now going to be two times the second column. We don't have to copy all of column one again. We just have to change the pointer of column two. However, if we try to work row-wise, this is much slower because now we have to copy both of these columns and alter both of these columns. Now both of these columns are pointing somewhere else. So in general, this is kind of the intuition of why R works faster when you work column-wise rather than trying to do row-wise operations. So the other funky thing that I, I learned about this chapter, through this chapter um, was this idea of a global string pool, <laughs> which I thought was a really interesting idea. So R is actually saving memory with character vectors by using what it hadly called the global string pool. So basically, if we create this character vector A, A, and then A, B, C, D, R will actually point two references back to the same character A. Um, at first, I kind of thought like, okay, does that mean that it has in memory at all times every possible string combination? That doesn't make sense. No. Yeah. You only get creative once <laughs> you create the string. <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought it's M2. <laughs> um, I was like, that just seems very inefficient. <laughs> no, that's not what happens. Um, <laughs> so basically, if you have, for example, a big table where the name um, Shirley appeared 15 times, we wouldn't have 15 different copies of Shirley. We would all point back to the same Shirley. Um, and so this is the global string pool concept. You can use um, lobster object size to find out how big objects are. So this is on two examples on the letters and on gplot diamonds data sets. Um, the cool thing about this is that you can see that lists are actually a lot smaller than you might initially think they are. And the reason that is, is lists are actually storing references to values, not the values themselves. So in this example, you create a, a vector of uniform distribution of a million numbers. You check the size, it's what, 8 million bytes. Um, and then you make a list y, which is that, that vector three times, bum, bum, bum. And you might expect that it's going to be huge, or you know, at least um, 18 million bytes. But no, it's actually just um, just 80 bytes larger than the original um, uh, vector was. And that's actually the same size as a list of three null objects. So the reason the list is smaller is because it's just storing the references rather than trying to store three copies of the vector itself, which again is you know, considering people like to trash on how R does memory management, I think these are cool little techniques for doing memory management. Um, I was impressed to learn it's doing all this nice little under the hood stuff. So give this example. 
how big do we expect the character vector created to rep banana 100 to be? Um, if the original banana 100 is 136 bytes, so because of the beautiful global string pool concept, it's not actually that big as well. So it's actually only 928 bytes. Similarly, um, the advantage of using lobster object size rather than the utils function, so there's also a utils function that will tell you object sizes. Um, utils can give you a little bit wrong answers, and the reason for that is, unlike lobster, it doesn't really properly account for the way shared memory is. So for example, if we have these two lists here, X and Y, Y is actually containing X. So the combined size of Y and X is just the size of Y because there's nothing additional there. Whereas if you do the utils, and I think it's one of the exercises we'll go through later, um, if you do the utils version of this, which is object size, it will give you a much larger size because it's not accounting for the concept of shared objects. So modifying an object will usually make a copy. However, what will happen in this scenario? So we make a vector v, one, two, three, and now we assign the third element to be four. So this is where we kind of break, um, break the modify and copy thing. Um, objects with only a single binding, so only one name, are modified in place. Uh, but it's kind of hard to predict when exactly modification in place happens. So this is kind of a memory um, efficient tool. So, so the case study they've done here is showing you what happens if you try to do a relatively simple um, operation of subtracting the medians of each column from a column in a data frame in a loop. So we make a little toy data frame, uh, which is a matrix of uniform numbers, five columns long, looks like this. And we get the median by taking the median each value. We can turn on trace mem to follow when the copying actually occurs. And then we've just run this five times, right? For, for each column in the data frame, say column, you know, one, one minus the median value, which maybe we would expect not to see copying. I wouldn't have expected to see copying based on what they told us about with the data frame. Actually, each time you do this loop, the data frame is copied three times. So I didn't quite understand the explanation of why this was occurring. Um, I don't know if anybody else did. If, if anyone else read the, the bit. No? Okay. Um, we can go back to it, but apparently data frames are copying when you use them like this. If you instead use a list rather than the data frame, the modification of list uses an internal C code. Um, so copies aren't actually made here in this loop. So rather than creating a data frame, we say Y is now a list, or X is now a list called Y, we turn it on, and when we do the exact same thing, we don't get copying. So it wasn't clear to me what exactly the internal structures of data frames were and why this happened, but now I know not to try and modify data frames in a loop, and I can see a nice little hacky way around it by making a list. So then he talked a little bit about environments. So I've never worked with an environment for an R. Um, I mean, I've, I've made a few environments in Python, um, like con environments and stuff, I guess it's a similar concept, but I've never done it in R. So they describe environments are essentially just a collection of objects, functions, variables, et cetera. Um, and environments are a special kind of object for R. So you can set up an environment here with the R lang M, um, assign some variables to them, A, one, B, two, C, three. You can make a second reference to that same environment, E1, E2. And 
and I've lost the slide. Yes. Um, oh, no. The other funky thing about environments is that they can actually contain themselves. So I guess they are the only R object that can contain itself. That's the other thing to be aware of with environments. So environments are modified in place in comparison to every other object type. Um, so for example, here we see e, E1, we assign E2 to be E1. Um, right now, E1, C is 3, E2, C is 3. If we now say E1, C is equal to 4, we see that E2, the value C, has also changed to 4. I assume also there are some reasons that will make sense later on in, in the book why this is the case and why this makes sense for environments. But I think at this point, for us, it's just important to know that there are two things that kind of break the copy on modify rule, which is um, objects that only have a single reference to them and environments. So what actually happens to these objects once we remove the reference to them? So we say x is a vector 1 to 3. Now x is actually the vector 2 to 4. And then we remove all x altogether. So actually, the objects don't just go away. They stay there in memory. So that was kind of interesting to me. Didn't realize that was, in fact, what's happening, but apparently it is. Uh, you're keeping these objects there. And the objects are removed by what's called the garbage collector whenever R actually needs more memory. So I guess once upon a time, people actually would call GC in their code when they were running to get more memory. Um, the book says there's absolutely no need for you to do that. You can call GC whenever you want to see how much memory you have or how much memory R is using. You can do it. You can also use lots of that we use to do it. Um, but nowadays, your operating system is going to take back memory whenever it needs it. R is going to remove memory whenever it needs to. You don't need to manually call it. it won't gain you any performance issues, probably. So, quiz time. So these are just the quiz questions at the start of the chapter. So given the following data frame, how do we create a new column called three, containing the sum of one and two? Anybody? I know. Uh, <laughs> I already checked it out. <laughs> so can I? <laughs> but I'll just try to explain anyway. Uh, so our, uh, the, the thing is that if we can only just use, we can use the hash symbol, but uh, we just can't write three because it's not illegal or it's not um, it's not an allowed, an acceptable name in R. So we need to use the back uh, back. What, what is it called? Yeah, back fix. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. So, in the following code, how much memory does Y actually use? So it, should, it should be the same, the same size as X, which is about uh, 8 million something bytes. Plus a TD amount for being a list. Yeah, so a tiny, a lot smaller than we expect. Um, and I think the, I think lists take like 80 megs or 80 bytes rather. 80 megs. Um, <laughs> so yeah, much smaller than we thought. Yeah, but an, an empty list takes uh, about 48. 40, a list takes about 48 just on its own. An, an empty one, yeah. And if you want. Um, okay, and then the final little quiz to see if we all understand chapter two. Hello. Hi. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> I wanted to ask a question in the previous um, slide, question two. Um, yeah. Alex, how did you know the Alex, sorry, how did you know that um, the memory was around 8 million bytes or? Had you done this before? I just wanted to know how you would know the size of a vector by just looking at it. Oh, I just uh, I don't know it by, by myself. 
Yeah, you can just run the code. Yeah, I just okay. ran uh, one one just oh, X. Okay. So X is one just one element or one 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 object. So I just ran that. Okay. Uh, yeah, so which line does A get copied in the following example? Last line. The last one. Because uh, it doesn't get copied until it's modified. Yay, so according to this, that means we have now successfully solved the uh, chapter two. We all understand names and values. Yay! <laughs> Uh, yeah. So then, basically, at the end here, um, oh yeah, what is what is everyone's thoughts, questions that we want to go back on? I had a question that I wrote down as I was going through, which I should probably just ask at the time, frankly, because it's quite a small one. Um, but I was wondering with the stuff on like uh, with trace mem and looking at uh, how it behaved in like our studio. I was wondering if that has implications in terms mm -hmm. of like, you know, these are the reasons why we want to know about where stuff's, um, where, where stuff's named what. If it's different in our studio, I mean, I'm normally working in our studio. Um, I, I was wondering if I was trying to think through whether that had implications for like memory and stuff or whether it was just a kind of quirk that just so meant that they were named as we were. Yeah, yeah. He said in the book that it shouldn't really have any implications for memory. And he also said, so the reason this occurs is that R can only count zero, one, and many. So whenever you're making an object in R Studio, um, you are basically never having the single reference, as I understand. So the only time we're having this um, modify, not modify and copy, the other word, um, modify in place is when we have environments or there's only a single reference to an object. With our studio, we're always having at least two, I'm pretty sure, because we've got to have the second reference for it to display to us in the environment. Um, he said it does end one minus many is still many, is, is the explanation for this. So he said in the book it doesn't have any implications for memory and performance issues. I think that's true, because I, I think how much memory a reference takes up is pretty tiny. So unless you really have in the like, trillions of references, I don't think it would matter too much. And in any case, you've got trillions of objects in your R environment at once, you've got problems. <laughs> Probably other than that. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Thank you. I was also interested in the global string pool. That was fun to learn about. Oh, the, the, the global stream. I don't really have a question about it. I just, I just enjoyed learning about its existence. I thought that was interesting as well. The one thing that really confused me still is, is that um, I don't understand this. Or, I mean, I can, I can understand if you tell me, okay, the data frame is copied three times each time I operate on it. I don't understand why that's the case. So I, I think, I think it's explained in the in the end note because it says there that um, all, all of the R functions make copies except the primitive one. So primitive functions, those written in C, uh, which R uses uh, sort of probably base R or something, core R functions, and they work with C and then they are memory efficient and everything else uh, when copying a data frame, for example, or any, or any other function. Um, that is written in R, actually makes copies and makes things slower. Um, I don't know if that clarifies things, but this is how I understood it after looking at the, at the footnote for the chapter. Okay. So basically, every R function, unless it's a primitive thing, is going to make a copy no matter what, which is why we should all learn C++. So that's, that's one of the, the, the copies because it makes three copies, right? Uh, so I, I'm thinking, I'm just guessing, is, is the other copy on the left-hand side, the moment uh, we are subtracting the median, 
and it creates another copy. Then the third copy is when we assign um, <laughs> that left-hand side to, to the right-hand side. I mean, that would make sense. I'll, I'll buy that. I have, I have no idea because I was like, <laughs> I, started, I started counting when I looked at this. I was like, hmm. <laughs> so hard. Yeah, yeah. So, do you guys want to? Um, go through the examples together, or do we want to spend like a few seconds, like thinking about them alone and discussing them? What do you guys think will work best? Um, I'm happy to go through them right now. <laughs> All right, let's do it. <laughs> so, and I said, okay. So explain the relationship between A, B, C, D, E in the following code. Um, so the way I view this is that you have, you create a vector, which is 1 to 10. Now that's an object in memory. You point at it with A. You now, in the second line, you point another reference back to that same vector, which is 1 to 10. In the third line, you point a reference to a reference. Is that what's going on here? So it's still still pointing to the same address. Is it so it's still pointing now to um, yeah the original oh, object. Yeah, the object. So it's still pointing the same object. And then D, we create another vector which is unique from the first vector, and we point it to that. Yeah. So it's one object yes. with four references. Is it one object? I thought it would be two objects. Yeah. Two with three and one with one? I, I think it will be one object. Uh, let, let me run it very fast here. Yeah, I mean, we, we that, can check it in it with lobster. Lobster, yeah. Yeah, yeah we can lobster this. <laughs> That's Love that name. Lobster. OK. C to B. We got two objects. Two objects. One with three. One with three, one with two. Nice. Okay. Good to know. Uh, all right. All right. Let me just. Okay. Uh, Sorry, let me say, when mm -hmm. I looked at that question, question one, it looked so simple and in my head I was like, there must be a trick somewhere. There's, there has to be a trick. So I, I, I had, I kind of had an idea it could be two objects, but um, I'm happy that it's two and we know how to actually confirm. I think before I read this book, I wouldn't have known. Um, so I'm happy that um, at least we, we are going, um, something I've learned. I'm happy with this chapter so far. We'll see how chapter two breaks us, but this one I think was okay, or chapter three does. Um, okay, so the following code assesses the mean function in multiple ways. Do they all point to the same underlying function and then verify it? Um, I have verified this one. They do all point to the same thing. <laughs> So you have just calling it mean, you can directly call it base mean, you can use get, um, eval queue, and match fung. I've never used before, so um, I assume this is something we'll learn about. Yeah, I was anticipating those being like some kind of trick or something because I, I wasn't familiar with them, yeah. but then yeah, I did the same thing and was like, oh no, they're the same, yeah, fine. <laughs> they're all the same. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why we're all so suspicious of the question. <laughs> <laughs> Do we trust this? Mm. <laughs> um, okay, so base R imports functions, tries to fix things. Um, why might this be problematic? Um, what option allows you to suppress the behavior? So I, I realized that I actually, I, I, I think I gave away the answer to this when I gave my example of like, 
is a cool way to use janitor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you could just start off with check name and fault. Um, and then, because I have had people send me things like that, for example, that are number and percent, that that is sent to me all the time. And if you just use read CSV, it'll just try to correct it away. And you're like, hmm, two of the same column, great. Yeah, well, I, I think you, I also saw on your slide uh, that you, you suggested the use of janitor. It's the first time I used it, I was, I was amazed. <laughs> wow, so clean. <laughs> Amazing, right? I've been writing functions to fix column names in my data, and then I was like, "Oh, somebody did this for me!" Yeah, I know. <laughs> did anybody go through the rules? I looked at it briefly. Sorry. Has anybody looked at what the rules make names uses is actually using? Yeah, yeah it, it like adds an adds an X before stuff, um, and it changes punctuate. It changes like not allowable punctuation to dots, and there might be other stuff. But yeah, I think yeah. it does. The last one is that it does like a a unique call on everything, to make sure that all the columns are then unique. Oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Good point. Yeah. Um, oh. All right, I didn't go through these. Any time to like read the thing, I didn't do it. Um. Can I can I answer this? I think I saw this. Why is yeah. that not a syntactic name? I think there's a place where the help page says adding a dot in front will work if and only if um, the dot or the period is not followed by a number. If I'm not wrong, there's a place. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Oh, okay. I read. <laughs> yeah, it does work. Cool. Yeah. I guess there are maybe some reasons, like maybe you want to add dots to your variables if you want to signify to yourself that they're going to be local variables inside functions. I'm sure there's like programmatic reasons why you want to avoid doing stuff like this. Or yeah, yes, 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 yes. Um, I, I've faced something like this before recently. I was doing some, some, some bio, bio data. And <laughs> basically, it just, it could, um, I don't know how to term it. Like if you're doing uh, some manipulation or mutation in the data, then you actually even get problems because it sort of like evaluates the, the color itself. It was, it was so weird for me to, to see that. So it could be one of the reasons that they're trying to prevent some problems like that. I also noticed when you use, um, sorry. I also noticed when you use supply, um, I, I was a very heavy user of the supply function. It kind of changes your variable names. Um, so you know, if you, and if you don't know, you can, you can have like, let's say a variable called um, country name or first name. Um, ideally, I think once you carry out the supply function, it will replace the space with a, with a period, a dot. So after that, um, you, you still have the original name in your head and then, and then the error you get is this, this is not found. And I'm like, why? And when I go back to the original data, it actually has that name. So there are some of these functions that really change um, the column names and we don't know. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's something to think about also. Functions that filter functioning ah, by <coughs> default. Is that the supply? So the supply function is doing that? Yeah, a supply. I call it supply, sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's one of those things, right, where you only read it, you never hear it aloud. Okay. Um, okay, so copy on modify. Um, okay, so why is this useless to call? I, I guess it's not the name of, so we're not tracing a specific thing that 
exists. <laughs> yeah. I also thought this was kind of like one of those tricky questions where you're like, it has to be more complicated than that. But I mean, my kind of answer for this is, yeah, yeah. same thing. We're not following yeah. anything, so there's no point to call, call it here. Yeah. OK. So this is another thing that it'll work if you do it in R in the console, and then it'll look different if you do it in R Studio. Um, but so you make a vector here. You specify it to be integer um, 1, 2, 3. You trace mem it. You modify it. Um, the third to now be four um, will give you that trace mem, basically telling you there's a copy on modify that's occurring, versus if you do it this way on the right hand side where you make a numeric vector, you trace mem, and then you change the third item to four, you won't get that message because there wasn't any copy occur. So the reason that I kind of worked out and I had to do it in our studio um, or in R is that we're actually changing the type of the vector in the second one. So that's something I, I always forget because I, I rarely ever specify that I want an integer. Um, so I, maybe there, we're going to learn there are some important reasons why you need to specify integers rather than numerics. And probably if we were getting very deep into the weeds of memory performance, I'm guessing that integers probably take less memory to store. I'm not totally sure. Then numerics. I have a question. In the first, um, in the first piece of, in the I don't know, first piece of code, the left one, um, if mm -hmm. we if we modified x such that x three is four l, I wonder if it will result into a copied um, object. I think I checked this, um, okay. which is kind of how I got to this being the answer of why we're not saying this. But let me double check. Where are we? Where are questions? Okay. Oh, I did. I did totally check this. It's like the last thing I typed. Um, Yes. So let me see if you let me share. Yep. Yeah, I'll share the desktop real quick. Does that work? Am I now sharing my desktop? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So this is the example basically. I've just got R as R in my terminal here. Um, we make the vector return on tracing. And we assign it to four, which is numeric. Okay, a copy occurs. Now, if we do the same thing again, we make a vector here. And now, rather than modifying it to be four as a numeric, we have it for the integer. We don't have a trace no fault because we don't have to change any of the um, the object type. I assume, which is funny that there's no discussion of object type that much in this chapter. And I guess maybe that's going to be in a later chapter. But that's nice. That's good to know. That's good to know. It means then if if we, hmm, hmm. let me think. Uh, uh, huh. Wait. Copy on modify means it's like R telling you, I'm only going to create a copy of this vector if and only if you modify it. Something close mm -hmm. to that, right? If you were to mm -hmm. say it in layman language. So I'm only going to copy. So on the left, whatever the slides, um, the piece of code you have on the left, as much as we've modified it, uh, since we've modified it rather, it changes because again, copy and modify. We've modified X. Sorry, I'm confused. Um, I have the idea, I don't know how to put it in words. Um, I don't know. Okay. I it's think okay. R must when it when it makes object memory. My guess is that probably it has a bucket where it's like, okay, 
the way I optimize memory is going to be different when I have to do it with an integer than when I have to do it with a numeric, right? So integers are 1, 2, 3, 4, and numeric can have 4.0, 0 0.7, 0 0.3, 0 0.5. So the moment I have to change from an integer to numeric, then, then it really is a different thing, and now I have to modify it. I think. I think is what's happening here. I don't know if that made things easier or just more complicated. Okay. And there's also, I don't know if this is part of the thing, but there's also that it doesn't need to do that if there's only a single binding to it, which is why the stuff on the right doesn't, yeah. doesn't change, because even though you're modifying it, because there's oh, only yeah. one binding to the X, it doesn't need to do that because there aren't multiple uh, names that it's bound to. Because I think that's mm -hmm. something that I didn't immediately, I didn't remember. Oh, and yeah, that's I where, sorry, and that's where maybe Anna is saying, unless we are having to deal with two types of data, two data types, right? And in that case, maybe there should have been a line. Maybe it's high chance for us to contribute and say, hey, I think this only works. Um, this doesn't work if the data types are different. And I don't know, something like that. Because if I, if I run the code on the left, I'll be like, huh, okay, what's happening? Um, but okay. But I think the thing is, if you run the code on the right in our studio, you will get basically the same output as you would on the left, which is why I like at first this question, I was like, it's not working for me, what is going on? And then I realized it's, it's because of that little thing where R has to store multiple references. And it's just, as Megan said, um, it has to do with single binding versus multi binding. Uh, uh, yeah, this is my explanation. Um, okay, so I tried to draw a relationship in in Google Docs. Um, this is my beautiful drawing. I'm not totally sure if this makes sense, but basically, I'll, I'll go back one. I'll go back one. So. We make a, a numeric object, a numeric vector. We make a list called B, which has two pointers to that numeric vector. And we make a, sec a third list called C, which contains both the list B, A, and then a numeric vector. So this is kind of my, my explanation. And then the cool thing is blocks to rest. We can kind of confirm that this intuition makes sense. So we make A, a, we point it to our numeric vector. We make B. Now B contains two references, um, which are both references pointing back to A. And then we make C, which contains three references. One points to B, one points to A, one points to the new numeric vector object. I think it's the lobster of the telling us. So that is exquisite work. I love it. Um, <laughs> um, the, the only thing that I, I'm not sure, and, the, and I don't know whether I've understood this correctly, and it's not actually to do with what's pointing to what. With the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I f was there somewhere in the chapter which said that when stuff references lists like that, or uh, sequences like that, it only keeps the first and last one so that it doesn't even need to bother keeping the middle ones? Yeah, I didn't get into it, but yeah, basically it's, it's since R3.5, yeah, um, yeah they, they store it as just 1 to 10. Which so I'll, I'll start you referencing. Oh, oh, rep is what they call it, right? I think all to reference, yeah, yeah, that's right. I have, I have a question here, just trying to understand whether I uh, understood it correctly. I would think that the arrows here, you, like if you start from A, pointing to um, 1 to 10, then when you move to B, uh, the green dots are going to point to, each of them are going to, uh, is going to point to 1 to 10, the object 1 to 10. you're right. If I'm reading lobster right, I think these, these arrows actually should be pointed here. Yeah. 
yeah, I think I had that wrong. Um, yeah, because you can see it in the lobster output too. So this is this one in here, is the same thing here. So rather than pointing to the reference, I should have it pointing to the object. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think yeah. I think that yeah. that is right. Um, so this arrow should be here, this arrow should be here. Um, okay. Yeah, but, but now, so I understand that for B, but what about, um, what about C? C, so C is this thing here. So that has one reference to the list itself. Yeah, yeah I, think so I think it goes to the two should be, dots. It should be here. That, yeah. I will fix that before I upload them. Um, yeah, so interesting. This here. I'm just learning how to read the, the, the output for here. lobster. Nice. Cool. Yeah, this is good. I, uh, I, I read this question and was like, <laughs> okay, I'm, I mean, I'm not actually going to draw anything out, so I'm just going to move on. <laughs> I'm feeling very artistic. Um, <laughs> all right, okay, so what happens here? So I also tried to draw a picture on this one, and I think also I think I have the reference here, maybe. So, so we make a list, and that list contains 1 to 10. So it's just a list containing the reference pointing to this object of 1 to 10. And now we make the second value of that same list be x. So now we've got the first object is pointing to this here, this reference here. And then the second is a reference pointing back to here, or pointing back under the stuff. I'm not totally sure how this works here. Kind, kind of correct, in, in a sense. Uh, okay, just also trying to confirm with the output from Lobster. Yeah. Uh, so the green, arrow, the green arrow would, of course, make more sense if it's like referencing the X, but the one above. So yeah, this yeah. one here. Yeah, I mean, it's the same X, but yeah, it's just more intuitive. Yeah, because we have one, two, and then three is a list, and then two is this object again. So is when we're getting this memory thing here for this list, is that the memory, that's the memory of the reference? this little green dot or it's, what is it the memory of the list not, not just a single dot uh, the, the, the whole of memory of the so, okay. so yes the whole Yes, so it will be for, for, for both of the dots. If we're looking at the, 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 the X so after kind of, updating it. Okay. Um, do you feel good about this? Sorry? Are we good with this one? Yeah? No? Yeah? Keep going? Yeah. Object size? Yeah. yeah. It's also, we're at the one hour time point. I don't know if anybody needs to run or anything. But I'm gonna just keep going. Okay. So, in the following example, why do we have the utils object size and the lobster object size giving such radically different uh, results? I think I mentioned this, um, but it has to do with basically the utils object size doesn't account for shared memory. So for example, in this y rep list run if 100, um, I think the object is a heck of a lot bigger and it actually is because the list is actually pointing back to the same thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, I also got uh, a, a, poor, a question uh, from which was answered by by Hadley himself, and he was talking about it, the same thing really. It's, uh, I can I can share it in the in here in, in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Please, please please explain again. I've not had what. I has said okay uh, okay so let, let, let me just read exactly what i want to can, can you hear me oh. you can hear me yeah yeah we can yeah, hear you so so he, he, he's like this is because in r 3.5 uh, one to ten, if you use the, the, the sequence, one to, to ten, for example, is represented as a special object type outrep, which is an alternative representation. That only requires storing only the first and the last um, number. So is, this is actually very small. But um, object dot size does not take this into account. However, object underscore size, uh, which is in lobster, does take that into account. Yes, uh, so similarly, object dot size does not take into account that Y consists of three references in this case. Or does not, consist, does not, does not look at the list as uh, referencing different objects. In that case, because we know that uh, lists reference uh, the store the references to 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 objects, so it adds incorrect size. Yet object underscore size actually take these takes these in account and does not over 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 I don't know over account for for memory which is not there. So there. Are there reasons why one would ever want to be using the utils object size? Is it just one of these esoteric, like old functions that now has been replaced by lobster? I, I, I think so. That's that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. So let let me share this with you. Only trust the lobster. Got it. <laughs> no. Hello. Hello. Sorry, I feel as though I've said hello like 10 times. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Wow, okay, sorry. So Alan, my question to you was, um, but do you think, don't you think rather that here the trick was in replicating the list a hundred times? Like I feel as though um, whatever you've read um, that's true when we have the ultra part, but in the explanation here, why the object underscore size is smaller than the object dot size, I would think, but I don't know much. Isn't it something to do with replicating a list a hundred, the list a hundred times? I feel as though it's not really more of the list itself than the replication. Um, that's how I was thinking because. I wonder if we run this code, and maybe it's something I should do without the replication part. Um, I don't know whether it will uh, be, bring a big difference, but I'm, I'm, I'm really convinced the issue here is replicating at least a hundred times, because we would assume that will be a very big thing. Um, and when you use underscore size, something happens. And we've covered this. There's a place we had list null, null, null. And in your, in your slide. Yeah, I, I think there are two questions here. I, want, um, I think this question has to do with, with as you said, having to do with replication. Um, um, is rather rather yeah. than the alt rep, but that's just also something to keep in mind. Yeah. So um, uh, the thinking Shelmid has about the replication, I think they made the point explicitly that um, 
because uh, R uses global string full uh, vectors does not repeat uh, strings. Maybe if we say it repeat 100 times, does not take much memory than by one time. Yeah, there is somewhere it can repeat something hundred times, but not make it take up Thing that will actually make um, a list it takes much size. So, what is this rep 100 actually containing? Is this is it yeah, I'm even, for characters? I'm even afraid to run it because I feel as though my computer will hang. But <laughs> I, will, I will think it's something that is very large, very, very, very large. Um, but then again, object dot size actually takes the the actual size of that vector, while object underscore size, I don't know, takes something different. Um, but I, I, I just as Sham Sudin has said, it has to do with um, maybe the global string um, stuff. So, I mean, run it doesn't create character vectors here. It's just creating, um, it's um, sampling, what, from the Numbers. uniform distribution, one to zero. So I'm not sure if it works. If there, there's not like a, I don't know, is there a global numeric pool as well as a global string pool? String <laughs> pool. Um. And I wonder if it's something about the way rep works as well. Because if I do, I've not checked it in R myself, but what's the difference between object dot size and object underscore size? What's the actual difference? Sorry, I actually had a lobster when I read this book. I never even knew there was a package called lobster but what's the actual like how would you explain it in layman language i love uh, that. I think it's just where they come from beetles versus lobster sorry i've not i think the difference is where they come from and i think lobster is just a um, has been worked on by more people and is a newer version and i think beetles is what shipped with r so we get to so they basically their function is check the size of an object, right? That's the basic function, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Is there something special about the way um, reps work? Out of curiosity? Is this pointing to the same thing? I just rep to replicate at least. Also, my, com my laptop's computation. Does rep just duplicate um, references? Is I guess my question. Because if we do this, actually, so everyone can see. I just have my. Eye. If we do this, I'm just curious about how the rep function works. Is it just basically point 
replicating a, a pointer to the same object? Is that how it works under the hood? Yeah, I mean, in, in this case, yes. It's, it's because it, it's, it's the same object, in a way. So it's repeating the same object 10 times. Well, in, in that case, we're going to have the same, the same um, address. So I guess the magic of ref is getting there. I'm, I'm not totally sure about that. Um, Um, I also have to get going soon, so in the next like four-ish minutes. Um, um, right. Did this question make sense to anybody? I did not understand it. <laughs> oh, thank God. I also didn't understand it. <laughs> I, I didn't uh, no, yeah. I didn't get this. Is this, is this but, larger but than it's supposed about, to be? Is it smaller? <laughs> yeah, so what, what, what I did was uh, I tried to get the, the sizes of the three functions separately. Mm -hmm. And it... it sort of looks like, um, if, if you have to run it on your computer, it sort of looks like uh, it's much big, this one here is much bigger than if you take the size of individual. Okay. Oh my gosh. It's so hard to function without a dual screen, but it's so very hot in my spot. Uh. Uh, mean. Bar. STD, right? Or is it SD? SD. Yeah. yeah. So if if you add those ones there, it's I think it was lower when I when I did it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Huh. So my only guess is that, I mean, standard variations should include the mean, I mean, standard, the mean and the yeah. variance, right? It uses those two functions inside of it. Yeah. So Why is its size somewhat misleading? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll think it's giving us the right thing, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. It's, yeah, I guess it's giving us the right thing. It's just maybe, I mean, because standard deviation has to share things with mean, mean and var. Yeah. It's, it's less than we might expect when we do the addition of them. And that's the misleading part? That's what I told. <laughs> the question is like, hmm. <laughs> different. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, Sharing okay. writing again. Um, okay. So I have to run. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing. But um, if everyone wants to edit, this Google Doc as much as you want. Just add in your own answers, add in your own questions, and then whenever we're good with it, like probably sometime tomorrow, I'll upload it as slides to the GitHub. Right. Um, um, so, ciao everyone. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. We'll see you next week.
Does anyone know? You. Thank you. So, oh, it's it's Al or Anna Lee, not Anna. By the by. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's fine. Oh, good work. This has been. You've actually made chapter two look simpler than it was when I was reading it. So, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> All right, see you guys next week. I'll see you. Um, All right, gotta go, guys. Okay, thank you, Alan. Thank you, you guys. Thank you, everyone. Um, see you, see you so, Novika? Yep. Novika. Who's, uh, who's Novica. being a class? <laughs> Pronounce it. It's, okay. uh, it's like uh, Eastern Europe, right? Yeah. No, no, no vision. Yeah. Okay. Close enough. Well, I thought okay. I had it right. Sorry? Yeah, so chapter three, have you got someone who's going to do it? Um, no, I don't know. We'll mm -hmm. see. Maybe we can chat in, we can, we can continue the chat in, um, in, in yeah. Slack. Uh, if someone can do it, that would be fine. I'm, I'm having my vacation now, so it might be hard for me to prepare next week. Okay. Bye, guys. All right. Uh